Ryan Waltz, welcome to the Man of War podcast, brother. Honor to have you on, man. Thank you for having me, Coach Same. All right, so this is going to be a little bit of a different podcast. And uh, I haven't done this before. So what's interesting about this is that um, we've been the Crucible, let's see, established in about four years ago, the Man of War Crucible. And we have never had anyone um, come on the podcast. And I have did that for a purpose because one of the reasons that I didn't want to have people on was because I didn't want to make it a big marketing scheme, you know, where I just wanted to have people on and, and then talk about what a great experience. No, I wanted to really build this Men of War Crucible, this Men of War Society, and let it build the foundation. Um, and here we are now, four years, um, and you're going to be the first guy on. So it's an honor to have you on. Uh, for people that don't know, uh, Ryan Walsh is... Um, he has been in the Man of War Society. What group are, are you from? I was a uh, group seven, G7. So, so group seven. So it's been, it's been a little bit now. Uh, with that said, I'm going to turn over, over the mic to you. You're going to give me a little bit of a, just a feedback on your life and where you are and all that good stuff. And then we'll, we'll take this conversation deeper. So I want everyone that's listening to this conversation to really understand what the Man of War Society, what the Man of War Crucible and what Ryan Waltz is all about and why he's here with us. Thanks for having me, Coach. I appreciate it. It's an honor to be a uh, first uh, MOW uh, brother to be on this. So thank you. Uh, about myself, uh, you know, Ryan Walsh, uh, 41 years old, married with four children, born and raised in New York City, uh, specifically Staten Island, which is one of the five boroughs for those who may not be familiar. Um, grew up my entire career, my entire working life from early age to now has been in construction. So whether it's owning a company, working for a company, um, doing electric work, doing demolition work, excavation work, what have you, my entire career has been from an early age uh, in construction. Um, my family currently lives in Staten Island. And as we'll get to later on, I'm currently in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Very good. So kind of walk me through, I mean, I mean, uh, I know that you initially were at a very high level in a company. So let's, let's talk about your position in this company and what you were doing and then how you found out about the crucible. And then we can go from there. Sure. So uh, like I previously mentioned, my entire career has been in construction, specifically electrical uh, out of the 20 plus years I've been working in construction. My focus has always been electrical contracting. So uh, early on, my family had a fairly large union company in Staten Island doing electric work. So I started there in the warehouse, worked my way up through the ranks, project manager, estimator. Uh, eventually, me and my father had some disagreements and I left, started my own demolition company. Uh, 2008, 2009 proved difficult for the uh, non-union demolition industry in New York City. At the same time, my father fell ill. So I went back to the family company. He uh, passed, unfortunately, at the age of 59. So my mother and I took over running Walsh Electric. We made it a woman-owned company. Uh, we grew it from 5 million in sales to 35 million in sales. And through a myriad of taking on some bad work, getting into sectors we weren't familiar with, we unfortunately had to close the business. Um, while that company wound down, I got into electrical manufacturing in Tennessee. Um, and during that two-year span, of doing electrical manufacturing, one of my customers was one of New York City's largest electrical contracting companies, uh, top four in size, over 500 employees, north of 70 million in sales. So um, me and my partner split ways on the Tennessee business. And I reached out to this particular firm who was a customer. He happened to be in need of somebody to come on and kind of take the company to the next level. So I was earmarked to come on uh, in, in September, almost four years ago, uh, before I resigned, uh, to come in and take that company to the next level, which, um, what started off as taking it to the next level, ended up managing it through COVID, uh, through being employee owned to coming out of an employee owned structure. So an ESOP, for those of you familiar, um, we had a, we had a really, um, challenging four years of me being at the helm of that company. 
Damn, and you were in the heat of shit because <clears throat> COVID, I could imagine how that affected the company and especially in New York City, man, that was holy shit. How did you handle that mentally? I mean, knowing that your everything was changing at that time. So I literally got there uh, in 2018, <laughs> spent a year and a half <clears throat> growing the company, bringing it to what we coined internally as Pinnacle 2.0. Um, and um, boom, COVID hits. Now you got people don't want to come to the office. Luckily, um, you know, thank God, construction was deemed essential. So what could have been a disastrous situation turned out to be a challenging situation. So really what, what we had to look at was what were the rules and regs to stay working? How could we leverage the assistance that the government and the local authorities were putting out? And how could we power through what we didn't know, what it was gonna look like or how it was ended. So, so in a true sense, it really was a day by day kind of navigation because you didn't know what it was gonna bring. Yeah, I could imagine it was very, very difficult. So take me down the road where, what were you looking for when you found the Crucible? So um, I signed up for the Crucible, I was 39. Um, as we may or may not get into on this call, my path leading up to 39 years old has been, you know, being married, having four kids, buying and selling and having moving out of a home three or four different times, a personal bankruptcy filing to double digit millions when a business failed, uh, fractured relationships with my mother because of the business failure, um, running successful businesses, having good partners, having bad partners. So all this kind of culminated up until I was 39. And, um, you know, when you start to look, uh, coach, in, in retrospect, and you start to look in the rearview mirror, I, I hate to use the term midlife crisis because it has a negative connotation to it. And I don't want to think that at 40, it was my midlife. But I just woke up one day and I said, you know what? If I look in the rearview mirrors at the past 40 years, and I was going to look forward at the next 40 years, where I am today, what is the next 40 years going to look like based on the past 40 years? And honestly, I wasn't happy with it. I wasn't happy with it financially. I wasn't happy with it relationship wise. I wasn't happy with it um, spiritually. So I was just, um, you know, I was uh, buying a Corvette at 40 was not going to do it for me, right? You know, the quintessential midlife right. price, get yeah. a sports car. Yeah. I, I was looking for something more. And, you know, for the past 10 years of my career at the time when I signed up for the Crucible, being a father, running a business, owning a business, you're always telling people what to do. You're always responsible for the split second decision. You're, all, you're only as good as you were yesterday. You're only as good as you could push yourself that day. It's rare you have somebody next to you or, or above you kind of extracting that from you. And, you know, a yoga men's retreat, uh, a weekend at the spa, that wasn't doing it for me. And, um, I happened to be on Instagram and I saw the post and uh, just something resonated with me. Um, you never know how hard you are and you never know how hard you aren't, right? And when I saw that video, um, and this is before I had any clue of what, what I call the day two brotherhood looked like. To me, this was just like, hey, you know what? I need four nights, five days where I could go. I could be yelled at. I could be pushed. I could be tested. And let me just kind of see, you know, what I'm made of at this point in my life to kind of gauge what I, what I had the ability to do going forward. Very good. So <clears throat> talk to me a little bit about when you hit boots on ground. You know, a lot of people don't really understand that. Uh, first of all, the process um, of each man um, that goes through the vetting process and then finally, you know, they get to meet each other, you know, face to face, um, the, you know, that, you know, that morning or actually that evening before, but uh, there had to be some type of um, I don't know, not only excitement, but I imagine also a little bit of anxiety, not knowing what was coming. It kind of walk me through that a little bit. Oh, well, you sign up, right? And, you know, you think, okay, great. I signed up for this thing in a couple of weeks, couple of months, you know, we're going to go and, and do something for four nights, five days, right? Life goes on. Then all of a sudden, you know, the communication starts, the list comes out of what you need. The group assignments come out. You start to realize, you know, Am I physically ready for this? Am I mentally ready for this? Am I emotionally ready for this? So, so the buildup leading to it, you know, I wouldn't lie. There were some butterflies. There were some 
did I make a mistake? You know, you know, the angst of leaving work. I was in, you know, at the time I was at, I was at the, um, the, the big electrical company. So leaving work for a couple of days was angst. Um, you know, was I physically prepared? What was it going to be like four nights, five days emotionally with leaving the family? So, um, and then, you know, you go and you go into an unknown location with a bunch of guys you don't know uh, to be physically, mentally, and emotionally tested. So, um, you know, there was, there was definitely some quintessential sleepless nights leading up to it, booking everything, getting set to go, like, you know, the oh shit effect sets in. But um, like I said, this was something that I, I wanted to do. Um, so through all that angst and question mark, I just said, you know what, let me, let me worry about just getting there. And then I'll worry about each day as it comes, but let, let's first just get there. So when you get there, now you have all different types of, you know, alpha personalities, all types of guys that, you know, for the most part, yeah, you, maybe you've spoken on, on some type of chat room or however they divided you at that time, but um, here you are face to face and not only that, but you meet the other groups, the, uh, not the other groups, but the other squads, right? And, you know, what was your feeling at that time? I've heard, I've heard some people tell me like, wow, man, you know, like you meet these people and you start sizing them up immediately. And everyone has a little bit of a, of a chip on their shoulder to prove who's best and so on. But give me an idea how you guys, your, your squad and how everybody else kind of connected. So, you know, obviously I'm impartial to G7 because that was my squad, but, you know, in hindsight, I think we had a strong group, um, you know, the night before we deployed, obviously we were all in the same hotel and, you know, you have a part jovial situation, you have a part size up situation, you have a part storytelling situation, um, you know, everybody kind of handling their nerves and their nervousness and in their own unique ways, who's sharing rooms, who's sharing stories, who just wants to go get something to eat. Um, but you could definitely tell there was a little, um, there was a little undertone the night before of like, you know, what are we getting ourselves into being that most, most of us were just meeting each other for the first time. So, um, you know, it was an interesting look into the dynamic of what was coming the next four nights and five days, because you, you, again, everybody's there at, at their own free will, um, all for different reasons, not having any clue what we were about to get into, but knowing that you know, something was coming. So here you go, you get hit the first day and you're in, um, it, was it, you know, talk to me about your expectations going into the program. Um, you know, I like to typically during our war room sessions, I like, that's one of the questions that I ask, you know, was this even in day one, anything like you expected? Um, most of the guys will say, no, this is very, very different, but was it something like you expected? Was it uh, maybe did it catch you off guard at any time or, or was it just confusing or maybe you were just trying to get your shit together that first day, which a lot of people actually do. They're, they're just trying to recenter themselves. So and most guys will res resonate with this, you know, being, you know, working father, whatnot, you always try to map out in your head what's coming in terms of a plan. Right. So the night before, did I have all the gear? Was I getting to bed on time? Did I pack everything I was supposed to be? You know, am I with the right squad? You're just checking off the list to making sure, you know, is my alarm set for the right time, right? So, so you're kind of just prepping all that. And then the next morning, you know, we have to meet at a certain time at a certain place. And, you know, you don't know what to expect. And the, the jovialness subsides and the nervousness starts to increase leading up to our time being there. Um, and then, you know, I'll be honest with you, the first 24 hours, I mean, could I, could I regurgitate what we did for those first 24 hours in, in part, but it, it was a blur, man. It caught, it caught me and everybody off guard. It was everything I expected and nothing of what I expected. Uh, initially you want to just get the fuck out of there, right? Let's be honest. You're like, what the fuck did I pay for? What the fuck did I just sign up for? This is insane. Um, but then, you know, you start to, you start to find your groove. You start to, you know, take one step at a time, but now to your point, um, you know, I would say probably out of all aspects of this physically was the only thing that I was prepared for. Um, I'm a naturally active guy. Oh, you know, always working out, watching health, eating, whatnot. So, so physically was probably my best preparation mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, I totally had no clue. I mean, you, you, you have no concept 
based on the Instagram and, and on the marketing material, what that entails. And, and honestly, coach, I'm glad of that because the less preconceptions for me personally, the less preconception I had going into this, the better the experience. Like if I kind of knew all these things now beforehand, I think it would have taken away from the experience and I wouldn't have gotten as much out of it. Like that element of surprise, the emotional side of it, the spiritual side of it, that's what made it good. Look, you could go to a gym, you could go to a CrossFit class, you could get your ass kicked physically and it has the benefit to it and you leave and you're like, shit, that was good. All those other components, you can't, listen, you cannot duplicate what the crucible does outside of the physical component. You can't. So talk to me about your wife. Okay. Um, was she supportive? Uh, was she questioning it? I mean, it, you know, it, it, there's a little bit of a, of a dichotomy there with women, you know, some women do support their men. Uh, I would say a good chunk of women actually, initially they're not a hundred percent supportive, but eventually, man, they wind up emailing us or calling us and letting us no, hey, you know, thank you for pushing our man that will, you know, the completely different to how he's walked into the door and so on. But talk to me about your wife specifically. Um, so at the time, you know, we, we were married uh, 13, 14 years. We've known each other since high school. So we have a, we have a good relationship. Um, one dynamic between me and my wife, you know, given all the businesses I've had started, successful, failed, multiple houses that we've had to move in and out of. My wife's kind of used to like my whims sometime, right? So this thing came across. Was she doing cheerleading uh, moves and cartwheels down the street when I told her I was going? No. Did I get hell about signing up for this and going? No. She was just kind of neutral about it. Oh yeah, it looks interesting. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. But managing a house with four kids and all the chaos that goes with it, um, you know, it, to her it was just like, okay, you want to do it? You know, go ahead. I'm, you know, I'm not going to get grief about it, but I'm also not going to you know, be a champion about it. I'd say she was neutral about it, which was fine. You know, I was good with that because, you know, me in her shoes, I, I think I would be neutral too. So I, I could deal with neutral. <laughs> and no, no, no doubt. And um, so talk to me a little bit about just in general, your experience in the crucible and how, you know, you mentioned that day one, it was pretty much like, just trying to get back to center and, and, and figuring out. And you mentioned also that eventually you start getting your bearings, which I think is so important because we do get some drops in day one. Um, <clears throat> and people don't give themselves an opportunity to start getting their bearings a little bit. Um, at what point did you shift and say, okay, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward. Um, I, you know, I got my feet planted now underneath me. Um, talk to me about that. So day one, you're there, it's hot. You, you go through the morning routine of day one boots on ground, which, you know, I won't go into detail with, but that disorients you to say the least. So, so you finally get a little orientated. It's hot. You with guys you don't know. Um, people start dropping, which uh, doesn't help the situation, right? Because everybody there is thinking about dropping. And when guys actually start to drop, you're like, oh shit, you know, people are really going to start leaving this thing. So, you know, day one, you kind of get settled. You kind of size everybody up. The, the guys who just can't cut it drop. Um, so day one, I wouldn't say you get your feet under you. I think you say, I think better would be stabilized, right? Everybody kind of, okay, we're here now. We got through that initial morning routine. You know, you get to your first meal break and you're kind of like, okay, you, you, your mindset shifts now to, okay, I got four nights and five, you know, I got five more days of this. Let's just take one step in front of the other. So. So the first 24 hours was unsettling, um, foggy, but you start, to, you start to get into the groove. You start to see who's there, who's making it. You start to kind of get a sense of what's happening. But again, it's the second you think you know what's happening or you know what's coming or that you've settled in is the second it switches up on you, right? So, and again, that's by design. And again, I, that's what I appreciated most about it because you never once coasted or you never said, oh, I got this. Or you never said once, oh, well, you know, I'll be able to handle this. Every time anybody thought we, we knew what was going on or what was next or how this thing was going to progress, it changed on you. And that's one of the key takeaways of the crucible experience, that element of surprise, that not resting on your laurels, that 
you know, when you think it's left, it's right. When you think it's up, it's down. And kind of that always, you know, swivel head, being alert kind of thing, which quite frankly, you know, being home in the same job with the same wife, the same kids, you lose that edge, man. You lose that swivel bobblehead. You become almost on autopilot and, you know, you, you need that. 100%, um, <clears throat> without a doubt. And so how many dropped in, in, your, in your group? Do you remember? Yeah, we, uh, uh, we lost uh, six total throughout the whole crucible. Yeah, that's actually you were one of the higher graduation classes uh, percentage wise than, than, than we had uh, in, in a while. Um, so, yeah, your group is definitely one of the top groups that came through um, the uh, crucible, without a doubt. So give me, you know, kind of quick fast forward to the last, you know, day going into graduation. You, you've made it. And you know, what, what was your feeling like? I mean, did you feel like maybe you had accomplished something or was it kind of surreal? A lot of people tell me it's kind of surreal after everything they go through um in in those five days and i'm going to kind of freeze that right there for one second i want to backtrack and i want to ask you a question do you think that five days can can really make an impact in you a lot of people say no five days is it's not enough it's not whatever but they don't understand the shit that we throw the the the, the kind of they have no clue what we're throwing at you so do you, for at least for you, did you think that that time frame really was enough to, to change some things in your life? 1,000%. I, I think anybody who, who and I'm going to go out on a limb here, I think anybody who says a five-day experience can't change them is either full of shit, never did it, or is not open to change, right? Because, listen, this podcast with you for an hour is going to change me not as drastic as a five day crucible, but every experience has the ability to change you. That, that five day experience unequivocally without a doubt has the ability to change people on a foundational level, not on a superficial level, not on a Facebook uh, profile level, on a foundational level. If you let it, if you let it, which there's no way the crucible doesn't let you let it, which is, which is kind of the inherent benefit of it that no one would realize until they go through it. Here you are graduating. All right. And then give me an idea of what you were feeling like. And, and, uh, and, I, and I remember your, your group vividly. A lot of good dudes came out of that group. Um, and uh, talk to me about how you felt and then how the guys around you. Did you, by the way, did you feel like you guys built a strong camaraderie, strong brotherhood with these guys? Uh, for, for the most part, the majority, yes. You have a few outliers just by nature of the personality of the guy, nothing personal, but just some, some guys don't like to get like that. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I can't speak for other groups because I didn't go through it, but for G7, I mean, the guys are tight. You know, we've produced, G7 produced three coaches that got asked to move up. A um, lot of really well-heeled dudes, um, big contributors on the portal, big contributors on the Facebook page. Um you know, the, the, these are guys that, you know, you know, golf a bit, if everything was to end tomorrow, this would be so, this would be guys you stay in contact with, right? That's, that's the kind of bonds that are created. Again, foundational, foundational change, foundational relationships. Um, this is not something that goes away, you know, as time goes on. This is, this is something that goes with you forever. These guys, these guys are solid. And do you feel like you, even now, like you, that you have a connection with these guys that went through this difficulty with you. Yeah. And the crazy part is, is albeit it's a different connection, but even guys that were not in the G seven other crucibles that I've come to know, deal with, interact with through various MOW functions, feel the same connection with not as deep because we weren't arm in arm through the crucible experience, but just knowing that they did the crucible experience and that they made it through is a neutralizer and gives you a common ground that unless you've gone through it, you, there's no, it's a very unique scenario because, you know, if you're a third degree Mason and you run into one, they, they know if you're a rotary or if you're a Kiwanis and you meet a guy, they know this, this is, unless you've done this, like you, there, there's just an underlying um, understanding that 
unless you've gone through this, you, you have to be in it to understand it. Very good. And so that day where you graduated, do you feel like there was that you had accomplished something very special that you do you feel like you had actually achieved something, uh, maybe a, a defining moment in your life? Um, you know, graduation morning when you're heading to the to the ceremony, you're kind of shell shocked that it's over because while it's happening, you're just trying to get to the next event, trying to get to the next uh, lunch break or food break. So trying to get to the next, you know, through the next uh, iteration. So when it's done, you're like, wow, you know, I really made it. Um, and then you start to just, you start to just size up what you went through and with who, and you just start to realize that like, again, and I used this term earlier, you really don't know how hard you are and you really don't know how hard you aren't, right? And now you have, at, for me, 16 other people that kind of just went through the same thing. So now the gloves come off, the shields go down, the chips on the shoulder are away. And now that's where the real relationship and the real bonding starts to happen is after the graduation, because all that bullshit that led up to why you were going, it's kind of neutralized. You just went through a five-day process together that kind of levels everybody. Now you're all kind of rebuilding from the same point of view, but with each other. And that, that is one of the things that blossoms and sets in as time passes. So what you would think like as time passes after this crucible, maybe guys lose contact or you're not as involved or you kind of lose sight of it. it ironically, the, and, and I didn't even think about this, the opposite happens the bonds become stronger, the communication increases, the going back to the crucible as a frame to where to start to model things becomes more useful, right? Because when you're going through it, you're going through it, what happens happens, you kind of don't understand. But once you start to go home and you start to implement these things into life, and then you start to talk to these guys more and you start to see business from a different point of view, you start to see life from a different point of view. Now, all of a sudden, to your point earlier, yeah, you're, you're a different person. You're changed. Without a doubt. And as far as the society goes, the man of war society now, um, <clears throat> you know, we can't disclose too much, but people ask me all the time, what is it, the man of war society? What is it? And a lot of guys that come from law enforcement or guys that come from first responder, uh, like firemen and things like that, or guys that are soldiers uh, that you know have gone through difficulties together, you know somehow they they claim yeah they're in the brotherhood. Me knowing what a brotherhood is, especially in law enforcement, um, a lot of guys just say hey he's a brother because he does the same thing or he went through similar things or whatever. Whatever, but the reality is that that's a bunch of bullshit. Okay, the, those brotherhoods for the most part are just uh, credential based brotherhoods. The type of brotherhood that we have here in the Man of War Society is, is, you know, and I want to open that up a little bit, the kind of contact, the kind of daily contact and, and, and different things that we have within the MLW and how we push for accountability and how we push for everyone to be better version of themselves and uh, supporting someone that's struggling or whatever it is. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So coming out of the brotherhood, you know, I underestimated, again, what I call the day two men of war part of the crucible, right? I underestimated the society. You figure, ah, oh, guys stay in touch, lose contact. Uh, but once you really get into what the MLW society is about and that day two brotherhood is about, um, again, what you're talking about, you know, police brotherhood and whatnot, although I'd never been in those, my opinion on that is, right, that's like almost like a career-based brotherhood, right? You guys are there, you're working, you know, so some people are there for a paycheck, some people are there for a pension. So there's a brotherhood, yes, per se. But remember, we're all here because we want to be here. We're all here because we are searching to be the better father, husband, businessman, leader. We're all here because Crucible was a neutralizer for us. We're all here because we're tired of running in shit circles with shit men doing shit things, right? So when you put all those people together who all come from those standpoints, the, the, the brotherhood aspect of it multiplies because of those things, right? Because I don't need to be here. I don't need to go to those things. I wanna be, so does Joe. So when Joe's there from Florida with his own problems, successes, issues, and I'm there, 
And we're there voluntarily on our own free will, neutralized by a, an event like the crucible. The brotherhood is almost a no brainer, but it's authentic and it's foundational in, in as much as I could do or say whatever I want to that guy, I'll never be judged. He'll help me. He'll lend a hand by nature of what the crucible does and why the involvement in the society post crucible is important and is, is a foundational shift, right? Because I don't get paid to be here. You know, it actually costs money to be here, right? It takes time to be here. But that is what keeps everybody engaged. And those guys that stay involved, that brotherhood is, is intertwined with success because of that, because we're all here because we want to be and because we're all striving to be those better titles I said before. So now let me ask you a question. The principles that you learned in the crucible and, and within the MLW and, and talk to me about how you're using them in your life now, because at this point in your life, um, you know, you've made some, you've taken some huge steps, steps that most men are too weak to do. Um, and uh, so I want to talk to you where you are. I want to talk about where you are in your life right now and your journey and how you're using some of the principles right now. So sure. So, you know, like I said, I went to the crucible approaching the age 40, not happy with if I used the prior 40 years as a, as a barometer, what the forward looking 40 years was going to look like. So immediately out of the crucible, you know, you start to implement little things. Um, from crucible to today through a myriad of wins and losses and challenges and problems and things. Um, I finally decided that, Hey man, you know what? Talk is cheap. Sounds good to use phrases like burn the ships, uh, LFG, uh, you know, one more of this and fucking power through that. Uh, yeah. All sounds well and good coach until you really got to put fucking feet to the fire. Then what happened was not happy in my career. I was not happy in my marriage. Um, I was not happy in the spot I was living uh, in terms of geography. Um, I was not happy financially. Um, I was not fulfilled. Um, and here I am, right? Running a massive company, making an enormous salary, four healthy kids, beautiful, uh, educated, thank God, no health issues, a wife, high school sweetheart. Um, we're all by the balls, uh, some would say rebounding off of a bad situation, but rebounding nonetheless, you know, active in MOW, a coach, right? From the outside looking in, coach, people would say, this fucking guy, he's doing, you know, two homes, you know, this guy's doing well. And you know what? I couldn't get out of fucking bed in the morning, right? And I said, you know what? I just had enough of this. So I resigned. Um, I decided New York City was not a spot that I wanted to further my career. My wife felt different. Um, I'd be lying if that decision did not put some pressure on our marriage for a couple months, um, put pressure on the kids, but through uh, soul searching, uh, speaking with some MLW guys, uh, picking up habits like meditation, um, mindful thinking, leading from the front, burning the ships. My wife and I figured out a way to make it work. So we liquidated all uh, our real estate assets because we felt at the time the real estate market was probably at its peak. So it made sense to kind of liquidate our, our, our properties that um, at the time had appreciated to nice value. I resigned from my current position and um, I left my wife and kids in New York City. And uh, I am living in an apartment in Tennessee four to five days out of the week, starting an electrical company from scratch. Now that takes balls right there. And <clears throat> most men would not even think about doing what you did. Um, where you are right now, how confident do you feel like you're going to make this happen? There is no doubt in my mind, uh, given what I've been through, what I've learned, and the support system that I have. Um, I'm not concerned about making it. I'm concerned. I'm not even concerned. My question is as to what level of success and how fast. Do I want to middle gear this and, you know, do it methodically? Or do I want to truly burn the ships and blow this up? Uh, because, you know, a funny thing happens, uh, Coach, when you, when you put yourself in a situation that I just outlined. Um, 
it's it's win or perish, right? It's 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 a win or perish mentality. And when I'm sitting alone in an apartment in Tennessee by myself, uh, in dead silence, eating a meal alone, and everybody's home doing their thing, and you start to do some, you want to talk about reflection, you want to talk about an oh shit effect, and you want to talk about reflection, and then you say, but wait a second. I got over 30 years in this industry. Wait a second. I have a wife at home who supports my decision. I have four healthy kids. I have the men of war behind me. I've been through more losses and setbacks than most men in their entire life. How do I not succeed right now? How do I, how do you not given that personal resume? Right. And I think a lot of men fail to do that. They're always worried about today or they're always worried about can I, but nobody ever takes the time to reflect and say, fuck, man, my personal resume wins and losses, goods and bads have me light years away of most of the population, especially today, coach, in this woke environment, not to politicize anything, but it is what it is. Look, look at the title of your book, The 21st Century Man. 21st Century Man today is not equipped to handle most of this stuff. And, and, in, and in this day and age, to be armed with what guys like you and I and people in the society are armed with, with the experience that we're armed with, you almost have to try to fail. And I just said, you know what? It's time, man. It's time to burn that ship. It's time to use all the books that I've read and all the men of war influence that I have and all the trials and tribulations that I've been through. It's time to use all that into one springboard and fucking not regret the next 40 years. My biggest concern is to be laying on my deathbed 40 to 50 years from now and have regrets, man. Because to me, that is fucking got to be the true definition of torture. Well, one of the reasons that I wanted to have you on this podcast was because I want you to mark this on your memory bank. And also where you can go back and review this video a year down the road, two years down the road, when you are kicking ass and your business is freaking taking off. Okay. Um, the bottom line is um, not only did you have the balls to completely leave your job where you were kicking ass at, but you basically moved away from a city that you have been living in for, for many years. And the fact that you have this complete you know, the, the distance between your family and, and, and where you are now, I mean, that, listen, most men that go through that would probably buckle at the knees and give up. But I know you're not going to give up because I know the type of mindset, the mental toughness, the um, just where you come from, I know that. Um, the beautiful part about this is that this is not only going to be a defining moment here in the starting point. This is going to be a defining moment for the rest of your life. Um, I really believe that the decision that you made, it's going to change you dynamically and put you in position um, to even get more confidence, to build your confidence, to build your mindset going forward. So um, as long as you can get your family locked in soon enough, and you could build your business where you are ground up right from there. I think good things are going to happen for you. And I'm proud and honored to have you on here, not only on the podcast, but in the MLW. You're one of my confidants. And uh, if people don't know, Ryan was promoted to be a coach um, not, you know, a few months ago. And, you know, this man is kicking ass. Um, there's a lot of good things about him. Um, but one thing you're going to get straight up from him is he doesn't bullshit around. He tells you pretty much straight up. Okay, and he is a great representation of the men that we have within the MLW. And I wanted to do this podcast because you're in the middle of shit right now. That's the thing, man. Like I caught you right in the middle of you making a huge transition in your life. And I want you to go back in time and then come back to this podcast so you can remember where you were and the effort that you put in into being successful. I appreciate that. And, and, you know, if it wasn't for the trials and tribulations and it wasn't for the failures, and if it wasn't for the support system you have in place now, my life would be different even a month ago, right? So it's because of the failures. It's because of the crucible. It's because of the men of war society and being named a coach it's because of the principles that make you think deeper and harder and longer and differently. Uh, that's why I'm here because it would have been easy to stay where I was, man. 
money was not a problem, comfort, people I know. I, I am in the middle of nowhere with people I don't know in an apartment by myself with no income coming in. So um, uh, yeah, that takes balls, but it's a calculated risk given what I have behind me. Oh yeah. And there's no doubt that you're gonna take it to the uh, stratosphere and you're gonna be out there in a couple of years, maybe even shorter time frame than that. You're gonna look back at this and say, damn, you know, um, I've come a long way, but I'm, you know, I'm successful. I'm, I continue to build, I continue to grow and you lead by example, man. That's, that's the whole goal here. So thank you for being on brother. I appreciate you. And uh, anything that you wanna leave for the audience, anything that you wanna speak from the heart about? Yeah, I just, you know, pick your circle wisely. Don't, don't be afraid to take the chance. Um, you know, I, I've been framing everything by two things. Number one, um, if I was 90 years old right now and laying in my deathbed, uh, A, what would my eulogy sound like? B, would I be remembered? And C, do I have any regrets? And if I could answer all those favorably, then I'm making the right decisions. And, and secondly, uh, coach, and this is something that recently has resonated with me, I am not gauging my success from today forward strictly on a financial metric. I've done that the past 20 plus years of my career and it never proves well. Um, money's important, don't get me wrong. And I've made a lot of it and I've lost a lot of it. And I've always had some and I've always had none, right? So, so don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that, but I don't wanna be 90, a billionaire with no friends and no family and no meaningful relationships. My success five years from now is going to be measured by my bank account, but by my circle, but by my relationship with my wife and kids, but my ability to put my head down on a pillow. And that probably has been, and I'll leave it with that, that has probably been one of the most foundational and cataclysmic changes for myself that I just can't be worried about money, 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 because you lose sight about what's really important. And that's really come to light over the past COVID blended with leaving a career, blended with getting involved with the MOW, that finance is just a piece of it. And I'll be damned if I'm rich and alone and not liked. Awesome, man. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, that's, those are powerful words. I'm going to leave it as that. Um, I just want to note something before um, we, um, we check out here. At no point was this interview bullet pointed. Um, this was just a straightforward conversation. I did not ask Ryan any pre or pre recorded questions or written or anything like that. Um, everything was pretty much just sitting down. He knew he was coming on for a podcast and he spoke his heart. Uh, and that's pretty much the way all my podcasts are. But I just want you guys to know that this specific podcast, um, this is not meant to be a marketing anything. It's just meant for you guys out there to understand that Man of War Crucible, Man of War Society is here uh, and we're building men, not just because um, they are, um, they want to be stronger physically, but because men want to make a change in their life, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, to build relationships, to surround themselves with, you know, like-minded men. That's why we're here. Um, and also to answer some questions that we've never done this before. So, Hope you enjoyed this podcast. Ryan, honor to have you on, brother. I appreciate you. There. I appreciate and, it. And uh, we'll talk soon, man. Hey, guys, if you don't follow me on YouTube, do me a favor. Go out there on youtube.com forward slash man of war. Also on Instagram, man of war with two R's. And of course, manofwar.us is our main website. You could also check out the crucible at men of war. That's M-E-N of war crucible.com.